All right, so today uh, we are talking about chapter seven, section three, notes, and it is all about cell transport, and it's about um, um, molecular molecules, water, uh, different solutes moving in and out of the cell. All right, so in order to move things in and out, we have to have something to move through, and that is the cell membrane. And specifically the cell membrane to relate back to what we talked about with macromolecules is made of lipids mostly um, with some phosphorus involved so if, when you hear a phospholipid layer it's actually two layers so it's a bilayer um, we're talking about the cell membrane and it's not just strictly phospholipids it's actually uh, has embedded in it proteins um, and other of the macromolecules we've discussed. So here's another picture of the cell membrane, and we need to remember that the cell membrane is called selectively permeable. Selectively permeable is referring to that the membrane is selective, choosy. It's picky about what it allows to move in and out of the cell. Something to think about in regards to that, if you think of a screen door, Right? Think about what it's allowing in. It's allowing air in, but not flies. It's selective, right? It's selecting for one thing, disallowing another. That's what the membrane is like. Mm -hmm. So here is a cross-sectional uh, picture of the cell membrane, seeing the two lipid bilayer, okay? And then also some proteins, channels, and other proteins, and some carbohydrates embedded in the membrane. So here's just a molecular view of what we've already talked about, sort of a space-filling view of uh, the lipids that we've talked about. And as you, can, as you think of, lipids, we know lipids, um, tend to be synonymous with fats. So think about what you know about fats and oils and waxes. We'll come back to that. So um, remember about lipids, thinking about lipids, that this would be the, um, think of the monomers and polymers that make up your lipids. This would be your glycerol type molecule, and this would be your fatty acid chains that make up the whole lipid itself. So um, we also talked about the um, hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions of the cell membrane. And the hydrophilic regions are the basically the heads of the lipid, the glycerols. And philic means they love water. So they can be surrounded and being exposed to water inside and outside the cell. There is also the hydrophobic region, which is the fatty acid chains, which means they are they hate water and they cannot be exposed to water. Remember, water is a polar molecule, and you can see the polar head there. Those are going to interact with each other, so uh, perfectly appreciative of water, thus loving, hydrophilic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this section, we're talking about how molecules are moving in and out of the cell. So there's two types of cell transport. There is what we call passive, and examples of passive transport is facilitated diffusion, simple diffusion, and osmosis, and we're going to go in depth of each three. And there's also active transport, and we'll specifically talk about endocytosis and exocytosis in these notes. So we're first talking about passive transport, and when we're talking about passive transport, we're talking about simple diffusion, and we're talking about different concentration gradients and where the concentration is moving. So think about um, spraying perfume all around your body, and then um, a couple feet away, uh, someone starts to smell that perfume. It's because it's diffusing into the air. And so what's happening when you spray that perfume, it's really highly concentrated around you, and then it will move to areas where it's in low concentration. So the material moves from high concentration to a low concentration. It's worth noting that this is being done with no energy input. So that's where the term passive comes in. So when we're referring to passive transport, the cell itself is exerting no energy to move things from outside its membrane, the inside its membrane, or from inside its membrane to outside its membrane. It's simply moving about due to uh, normal molecular movement, much like the example that Ms. Ramsey uh, illustrated there for you in talking about perfume, right? It's simply moving about because those particles of perfume went from where they're very packed together, they're bouncing off each other in the air, and they're spreading out 
um, to areas where there's not as much of it. Okay, so now that, so passive um, transport with simple diffusion is just talking about molecules. When we're talking about the diffusion of water, it's called osmosis and how water can move through the selectively permeable membrane that we talked about earlier. So diffusion really means anything moving from an area of high concentration to a low concentration when we're talking about chemicals anyway. Um, and water, if it's water, it's just given a more specific name of osmosis, but uh, osmosis is simply diffusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is a general visualization of how you have your cell uh, membrane and you have a high concentration of solute in the outside of the cell, okay, and you have basically a low concentration um, inside the cell. And so what happens is the um, selective, so this is selectively permeable, let's say, what could we give as an example of a selective permeable? Oh, oxygen. oxygen. Oxygen is a good example. So oxygen here is really high on the outside of the cell and it's low on the inside. So it will diffuse over into the inside of the cell so you have a balance. So it moves from a high to a low until you have a nice balanced concentration and equal on either side. So to put this into a little bit of context, extracellular space simply means space outside the cell and usually what we're referring to are blood vessels. So if you can imagine a blood vessel flowing by this cell membrane, if it's a, a uh, artery or an arterial type blood vessel, it's going to be loaded with oxygen and that oxygen, because there's so much of it in there, is going to move through the membrane into the intracellular space, which I think we can all understand is inside the cell, simply through diffusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so facilitated diffusion is basically talking about diffusion, again, the process, but in this situation it's talking about how there's these proteins, these uh, carriers or channels that actually help move larger molecules through the membrane. Again, no energy is being utilized by the cell to make this happen, but instead of it being oxygen, something very small, we're usually talking about a larger molecule. It's still moving through the membrane without energy being added by the cell, but it can't just move through the, the phospholipid bilayer. It's just too big. It would mm -hmm. rupture it, so it needs to find a doorway, which is what these channel proteins are. Yep, and so um, the carrier proteins, they help the molecules move through, and so some examples would be uh, of molecules that are large would be proteins or sugars. So here is another picture of facilitated diffusion. Um, you have a protein channel here where the uh, molecules are just flowing down through inside and outside the cell. You have carriers where it will open and then it will close and bring the proteins out. Again, to put this into context, imagine the little green things in this extracellular space, i.e. blood vessels, is sugar. Sugar that you've ingested, um, right, uh, glucose. But glucose is too big uh, to make it through the normal phospholipid bilayer, so it has to find a doorway, which is what these protein channels are, and it, but it's still moving uh, with no energy being added. It's just going from where it's highly concentrated in your blood to where it's not as highly concentrated inside the cell. It's just using a doorway to do so. Mm -hmm. All right, so we need to talk about a little bit more of osmosis when we talk about that it's the diffusion of water, the movement of water, and it all ha relates to the solute concentrations, and so we have these different types of solutions, and so... Remember, water is the universal solvent, so mm -hmm. lots of stuff dissolves in it. Our blood is largely made of water, so when we're talking about solutes, we're talking about largely things that you've ingested in your diet, to put it in biological terms. Um, but there are specific ways to look at uh, solute and solvent uh, relationships and whether or not it's going to move in and out of the cell and how it's going to affect the cell. The first one is called hypotonic. Hypo, by the way, means below. A hypotonic solution is where you have a lower solute concentration on the outside of the cell, and so water tends to move into the cell because of that. Into. And this can occasionally cause uh, cells to swell and even potentially burst, which obviously is detrimental, even deadly if enough of them, enough of them burst. Mm -hmm. A hypertonic, hyper meaning higher or above, uh, solution is where you have a higher concentration of solute outside the cell, so water moves 
out of the cell. Because you have a higher concentration of solute, think about it, now it means you have a lower concentration of water outside the cell, which is why that water is moving from where it's more highly concentrated in the cell to, to the outside or the extracellular space. So as you can imagine, this would cause a cell to shrink if it's losing water. So in a hypertonic situation, solution, a cell will shrink. Due to the water moving out. And then finally, isotonic um, is a situation in which solute concentrations are the same on both sides. Iso, as Ms. Ramsey's writing there for you, means equal. And in that case, right, if you have no concentration gradient, in other words, if you have no difference in concentration inside or outside the cell, water is going to, it will still move. Make no mistake, it doesn't quit moving, but if two move out, two move, will, move, will move back in until it's equal. So it's, this is really a situation of equilibrium, where these uh, even out. Okay, so we have a picture here showing you the situations between hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic, and it's showing you where the water is moving. And if you look here, what, we're, what this is representing is actually red blood cells. So they look kind of like little red donuts. And mm -hmm. if you were to put a mass of red blood cells into a hypertonic solution, you can see what's going to happen to the cell, right? Water is going to move out of the cell. Um, if you were to put it in an isotonic solution, which is, of course, what we would most likely like to maintain um, in our bodies, you can see that the cells pretty well remain the same size. You have some water moving in, some water moving out, but it equals out. If you were to put them in a hypotonic solution, now you can see water is flowing into the cell and causing it potentially to burst, as you can see in one, one spot up there. Right. And so remember, the hyper means high concentration. Iso is equal concentrations both inside and outside. And hypo means the higher concentrations in the inside of the cell. Of the solute, mm -hmm. right? OK, so now we're talking about active transport. So active transport is actually the movement of substances. They're going the opposite against the concentration gradient. So that means normally macromolecules move from areas of high concentration to a low concentration. In this situation, um, um, active is moving from an area where it's a low concentration to an area where it's high. So this is kind of swimming upstream, so to speak. It's requiring energy thus active, right? So the cell has to play an active role in moving these things in or out of its cell. Maybe it's a waste product that is made um, too much of. Uh, it needs to remove that from the cell, and it might require, and if it does require energy, it will be using something called ATP, which we'll be talking about uh, in later chapters. Right. Okay, so if you were to give a visual representation of the differences and similarities between passive and active transport. You notice that passive, it's moving from an area where the high concentration to an area where it's low concentration and there's no energy needed. It does this naturally. This is an example of facilitated because we have this channel here. Over here in active transport, we still have like this protein channel situation. However, you're moving from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration that's again opposite. And also you see this uh, symbol here, ATP, that is energy, and the energy is needed to start this um, reaction, to this ability, this movement to occur. So thus the cell is actively involved using energy that it's generated to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in active transport we have two examples, and they are called endo and exocytosis. Site, if you recall, means cell, and osis is a condition of and so basically what we're talking about here is an endo within, or moving in, exo, as you can think of, exit, moving out. So a condition of moving something into the cell is referred to as endocytosis, especially when it requires energy. And a condition in which you're trying to move something out of the cell using energy is referred to as exocytosis. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, we are talking about very large molecules for this to happen. And so, like we said, endo means move in, exo means move out. So um, here is a visual picture of a giant macromolecule that needs to get into the cell. And so it, the membrane comes around, it pinches off, and brings it into the cell. So this is an endocytosis picture.